Welcome, everyone. Um, it's really our pleasure here at Femina to host this really important um, event on a very important topic um, that's um, critical in the MENA region because it's critical to stop um, sexual and gender-based violence against women in the workplace, but it's also critical to do it in a way that doesn't push women out of the workplace in the name of supporting them. So it's really a double-edged sword. And um, you know, with the um, ILO uh, Convention 190, it really opens up the way for us at, in the MENA region to talk about this issue more publicly and openly, but also to keep in mind perhaps the cultural and political sensitivities that exist with respect to women's work. Um, also with the I ILO 190, it's important to keep in mind that um, in much of the region, not all of the region, but in much of the region, this kind of work, prevention of violence against women generally, but specifically in the workplace, is something that has been spearheaded by women's movements in civil society because we don't always have businesses that are um, very open to this um, and governments, or we don't have very free labor unions who you know, are concerned or able to operate to support and protect women in the field of war, in their, in their workplaces. So we wanted to highlight some of the work that has, been, that has happened in the region that's been e either entirely spearheaded by women or partly spearheaded by women's organizations and civil society. I know the case of uh, Lebanon is a little bit different because it's a multi-stakeholder effort, but generally in many of the countries, some of this work has really been spearheaded by women's movements you know, because talking about violence tends to be taboo and difficult. Um, but they have done marvelous work, and it's important to keep that in mind um, as we try to document successes for the ILO 190, some of the successes that's happened in the region. If, you know, and especially um, ILO doesn't have a lot of case studies um, of successful examples um, from the MENA region. This is something that our organization, Femina, is working on. We're documenting work that's happened in Egypt, in Iran, and in um, Lebanon. Um, perhaps other countries as well. Um, so I, just to give you a little um, background on, on Femina, Femina is an organization that supports women human rights defenders, their organizations and progressive feminist movements in the, MENA, in the broader MENA region, including some countries in Asia, such as Afghanistan. We're very pleased today to have an excellent um, group of speakers with us to discuss the work that's happened around prevention of se sexual and gender-based violence in Egypt, in Lebanon, and in Iran, and also a little bit in the region. I think um, with Charlotte, I'll introduce the speakers, and then we'll organize, we've organized this as a series of questions to the speakers so it can be more of a conversation, and then we'll open it up to participants who um, um, are present so they can ask questions. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speakers uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, our first speaker is Ahmad Hegab. I've known him for several years um, since you know he lived in, in Egypt and when I used to visit Egypt often, but Ahmad is a campaigner, trainer, and content creator. He's the winner of several awards in community development as a result of his work confronting sexual violence and engaging men in confronting SGBV. He was selected during 2017 as one of the world's best role models for men to stop violence against women. He is a board member at Harass Map, which is a very well-known organization in the region that's worked on prevention of violence against women, especially harassment. And um, he's an ex-Safe Areas unit manager. Ahmad right now is leading the technical team in Amina region program, working on localizing digital safety for ordinary women and girls to combat technology facilitated violence at the Security Development Foundation and SecDev Foundation. Our next speaker presenter is um, Charlotte Karam. Charlotte holds a PhD in the Ian Teffler Professor Professorship in Inclusive Human Resource Systems at the Te Telfer School of Management in the University of Ottawa. Uh, she is also an adjunct professor at the American University of Beirut, where she served as an associate dean and was the founding director of the Center of Inclusive Business and Leadership, CIBL, which I think many of you may know is really a leading center 
that works on prevention of violence against women in the workplace, gender-based violence in the workplace, with over 10 million in external funding for the KIP index and SAWI projects, Charlotte and her team engage employers to train, support, and track the dignified and equitable recruitment, retention, and promotion of women into paid formal employment across the MENA region. For this work, Charlotte was recognized as a global gender champion by the US Department of State and one of the 100 most influential people in gender policy by a political. Um, we're very pleased to have Charlotte. I think she comes with a great level of experience, both in Lebanon, but also the region, which is very helpful. Our other speaker is Tara Seperifar. Tara is a researcher at the, in the Middle East and North Africa Division at Human Rights Watch, where she investigates human rights abuses in Iran and Kuwait. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, she was the Deputy Director of the Human, right, of human Rights in Iran Unit at the City University in New York where she worked on projects supporting the mandate of the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Iran. Tara graduated from Sharif University of Technology in Tehran and holds an MA and LLM degrees in international law from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. She's a native speaker of Farsi, also excellent speaker of English, very fluent. She also works on human rights situation in Kuwait as a researcher. So thank you very much to the stellar group of speakers here with us. We're really excited to have you. I am going to ask a series of questions from our speakers, and I'm going to start again in alphabetical order, starting with Ahmad. Um, I keep stressing this so that people don't think that I'm playing favorites with Ahmad. I keep introducing him first, but Ahmad, you were at Harass Map is a very well-known organization for its work on prevention of street harassment. How was it that you began working on harassment in the workplace and especially with more established organizations um, such as, you know, businesses such as Uber or universities in Egypt? Uh, okay, so harassment work on prevention street harassment uh, started in 2010 and for four years, like 2014, was very uh, experimental and successful at some uh, point, but still, at all the work that we have done at, the, at, the, at that moment, it was like a drop uh, on the sea of 104 million living in Egypt. We work in specific places, but like not everywhere. Uh, also changing the mindset of thousands or 10,000 of bystanders witnessing harassment or small shop owners, or like just people are working on the street needed a lot of volunteers, resources, training, street uh, events, um, funds, and we didn't have like all of that. So we knew at this point that we need institutions to join our race against sexual harassment to make the change we are aiming for. We needed others to transform this case to them. So it's not only that NGO that's working on uh, sexual harassment there. So um, we needed respectful institutions to join our race and to talk uh, about the same case, using the same uh, words, using the word sexual harassment. Um, working on the street gave us so much information about how people respond to sexual harassment and how they deal with it. Like normal people were like the same, like business owners or like people are working in companies. There were like five common factors of resistance uh, from people we dealt with, um, those factors were like in the streets, institutions, corporates, media. Uh, the first one was like denial, uh, recklessness, uh, comparison of suffering, silence, and strengthening the status quo. I remember getting invitations uh, to organize like a workshop or to give a speech about sexual harassment, but like someone on the phone tell us, tell us like, we can't say the word sexual harassment. And that's back then in 2014 or like 2013, like at this moment. So invitation like this came from school, universities, corporates. Sometimes they had the sexual harassment case happen there and they want to deal with it in a low profile way, but still they're afraid to say the word sexual harassment. They, they don't want to be associated with sexual harassment somehow, even like big corporates, even um, uh, big institutions working on, um, laws related to uh, the workforce or something. Um, at this point, we didn't compromise. Like other um, initiatives would like go and say, okay, we will talk to like hundred or like thousands of people at some moment, 
but like we insisted on using the word sexual harassment for so many years and because we did that and with um, uh, other organization we had uh, sexual harassment law uh, came out in 2014 and that was a great uh, success for all the organizations that working on sexual harassment working with uber was part of the safe corporate program uh, that was established in 2015 uh, after the success we had in uh, the safe universities program like between 2014 and 2015 we worked with um, 10 public universities those universities are dealing with one million and a half like students uh, 400,000 um, employees staff security personnel um, and those numbers are like people were talking about sexual harassment and events and between 2014 and 2015 it was a big big uh, shift but back to the safe corporate program and the safe university program the two program use the same uh, or the similar method somehow so what we do that we go there uh, work with a champion or like a group of champions inside the institution train them give them resources help them lobby inside the institution till we reach a deal or a partnership. The same thing happened between like universities or corporates, Uber was one of them. Uh, we like worked with someone from inside from the marketing team. And it was like, like some kind of personal meeting in the beginning. And then we engage a few more people from inside the company. And they, they wanted somehow a media campaign we wanted uh, a bigger uh, training and uh, awareness campaign between uh, their driver. So the idea of localize the effort and knowledge inside each institution made the change look normal. This is not the NGO with a foreign agenda coming to change us. It was more like it's us facing the problem and we need to change it. And that, that's really important. And also one of the most important factors in those programs was that we, from the beginning, we, we give all the credit to our champions inside an institution. So it's not HarassMap that doing this, it's those uh, group of professors or those group like the marketing team at this company. And that we, we would give them all the material, we would like guide them how to use it. And that was a really big factor. So every institution or like organization or corporate they are talking their own language. For example, corporates are talking business. If you could deliver the message, sexual harassment is bad for the business, they will talk to you. Universities also have their own language. And even like each university and part of Egypt was using different language with sexual harassment. Like if we go to other Egypt, like Aswan University, it's a different when we are talking to Cairo University, like uh, in the capital out there. So, we made the harassment model went uh, viral somehow uh, in, uh, in those 10 public universities and corporates like Uber by using those factors. Give them all the credit for the champions inside, work with them for so, uh, uh, for so many, like many months, maybe two or three years at some, uh, with some universities, and then they will lead the change uh, inside. I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. No, you, of course you answered my question. I think it's, you know, it's a really good snapshot and I will have, we'll have plenty of time for question and answer. So I already have some questions for you about how you specifically did this. But um, uh, Charlotte, please tell us about, first of all, the kinds of violence that women face in Lebanon, but then also how you went about creating a multi-stakeholder um, uh, approach to prevention of um, sexual and gender-based violence in the workplace in, in Lebanon, working with different sectors and, and you know, the role that civil society and women's groups played it as, as one of the stakeholders in that process. Sure, thanks so much, Susan, and thanks, Ahmed. Uh, I uh, read and a lot about Harass Map over the years, so it's really great to be able to put one of the faces to it. Thanks for all the great work. Um, so I guess the, you know, to um, start with the types of violence, you know, break down your question into three parts. So types of violence, I think um, that we see the general situation in Lebanon is quite the same as we see anywhere, I think, in the world. 
um, the types of violence that women face in, in Lebanon, in the streets, in public, um, across sectors, is pretty is no different really than than anywhere else in the world. So you have forms of structural violence, you have forms of interpersonal violence that manifest in many different ways. There's the idea that we're talking about here, which is at work. So, you know, that's even complex when you think about violence in work. So are we talking about formality or informality? Are we talking about paid or unpaid? Are we talking about care work or other forms of work? Um, so violence is everywhere. Gender-based violence is everywhere. Um, and without diminishing or not acknowledging this breadth of violence and, and, and gender-based violence at work, I'm going to focus, you know, all of my kind of discussion here today specifically um, on sexual harassment, but more specifically on in the formal context of paid employment. Um, so by by sexual harassment, you know, I now there are many definitions of sexual harassment, many ways of thinking about sexual harassment. The one that I'll adopt from my perspective today is the one that we've been working with over the last few years, which is the way that our law 205 define it. Um, which is very much aligned with the U.S. model, not the Sharia model, not the French model of sexual harassment. So basically looks at violence against women uh, in, in the form of sexual harassment as the recurring misconduct out of the ordinary, unwanted by the victim with sexual connotation. The definition is quite interesting because it also talks about um, sexual uh, uh, forms of violence that come in words, actions, signals, suggestions, illusions, electronic means, so it's a very broad definition. Um, but going back to the, the, the core of your question, what's the general uh, situation of forms of gender-based violence at work? As I said, it's bleak, and there are challenges facing women and inhabitants of Lebanon more broadly. Um, we see a huge rise in, in the stress and despair and poverty and unprecedented levels of gender-based violence that are being documented by women organizations and civil society organizations across the country. Um, this these, due to the multiple layers of crisis in the economic collapse uh, in the forms of the uprisings against the government after the Beirut explosion, with 80% of the population being forced into private or sh shoved into poverty due to the economic collapse in the country. Um, but even before this, even before 2020, studies show an alarming number of sexual harassment in Lebanon. For example, in the uh, 2017 UN Women Pro Mundo Images Survey, which happened over three months, 60% of women reported being sexually harassed. We have a harass tracker, which is inspired by a harass map in Lebanon that also document um, form, uh, cases of sexual harassment across the country. Um, Sybil, the Center for Inclusive Business and Leadership, um, published two indices uh, that looked at 11 countries, one of which was Lebanon. Um, and these two indices, one of them is a feminist ind index, which means that it's taken from the voices of women across the region. And then a HR corporate index, which looks at, um, which, which gathers primary data from HR experts uh, in companies across the region. Um, when we look at the lived experience index, it's quite interesting. We find that, um, that in Lebanon, like other labor abundant resource poor countries like Jordan, Tunisia, Morocco, women report a relatively lower willingness to report incidents of sexual harassment in comparison to other countries in, in, in the areas like the Gulf countries, resource rich labor importing countries or, or the resource uh, rich labor um, abundant countries. That's quite interesting, right? Um, why is this the case? Uh, clearly showing we need more mobilizing, more work to do this. The KIPP index shows a scarcity of, of sexual harassment policies and a scarcity of enforcement, even when there's a, a, a policy, sexual harassment policy, they are not enforced by the employment sector across the sectors that we looked at, which are six. Um, the overall regional score for, for having a policy and implementing is 13 out of 13.12 out of 100. So really quite low. Lebanon in particular scores a little bit above that average. I think with the push uh, around um, the mobilizing around the sexual harassment law and the mobilizing with the private sector, which I'm going to talk a little bit about um, to end and my seven minutes here. <laughs> so 
I'm going to be remiss if I don't take a step back and think about the women's movement and the civil society organizing to address sexual harassment and how that came about in Lebanon. So the legislative measures, policies, and programs to address violence and harassment in the world of work have been rather slow and rather partial over, over many, many years. This is despite the fact that there has been sustained advocacy by women's organizations and feminist organizations and activists for the last four decades. The last decade, nevertheless, has witnessed an important shift where we have this outward, as Ahmed was describing, this outward um, labeling and calling uh, protests and outreach and training efforts and aware, uh, awareness raising, bringing demands for measures of gender-based violence into the public domain, influencing public opinion, seeing it on TV, seeing it in social media, seeing it in schools, seeing it being talked about. There have also been a significant reform to the country level in terms of the anti-sexual harassment work specifically. So sexual harassment has been long on the agenda of women and feminist organizers and intermittently in the efforts of elected or appointed government officials. Anti-sexual harassment effort easily fall, of course, off the agenda of, political, of the political agenda. And now with instability, we see less and less of it. However, as governments come and go, our work at Sybil has been with three government failings, <laughs> three different government machineries. Um, there have been a number of really significant effort and champions and allies in across party lines and across multi-stakeholders. In 2012, we saw the first initiative to bring legal reform with a feminist collective and legal agenda. They drafted a law, it was completely ignored. It was an excellent law in my point of view, um, followed many standards acknowledged agricultural workers, um, acknowledged domestic workers, 2000, but went nowhere. 2014, uh, MP Ghassan Mkhaybir submitted a law uh, where both sexual and, and racial harassment were uh, would be legally criminalized. It was laughed out of the parliament. It was famously ridiculed uh, in parliament. 2017, we had the first minister of women, Jean, a man, Jean Auguste Pien, supported by Abir Shpado, submit a different draft law that was approved in the minister in the cabinet, um, but ultimately. Um, was then revisited in 2019 with Abad, civil society, SEED, civil society, LLWB, civil society, Sybil, and a university, as well as uh, Violette Khairella, an MP, who is a, min sorry, a minister of state for economic empowerment. Um, and the Nash at that time, there were two laws being drafted. There was this one, and there was a second one by the National Commission, um, led by Claudine Hon. It was this these two draft drafting of these two draft laws and all the history that we, we came together as a group and we worked together to create a consolidated version, which then passed in 2020. So it's a historical movement of multiple sectors. And one last thing I'll say is that our work with private sector on the anti-sexual harassment policies in the, in the context of no law for many years, helped us to lobby parliamentarians because at the end of the day, in most of the Arab world, the leaders of business are the leaders of government. And if you can get them on your side against gender-based violence, it's something that one should do, in my opinion. I'll stop there. Thank you. I hope That's I answered your question. No, no, you were excellent. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I mean, obviously, whatever passes into law, you know, goes through a an extensive, especially when it has to do with women in this sense, has to go through an extensive process. And it's never as if one parliamentarian one day comes and says, let's do this. It's always really the result of women's work of women's groups over decades to raise that awareness, to get parliamentarians, business, other sectors involved and interested in this kind of work and to champion as, as Ahmad said. And I think that that's really critical. Um, um, my next question is to, to Tara, Tara John, tell us a little bit about, you know, the, you know, you did a lot, you've done a lot of research on, on this, you know, the um, women, the types of violence the women face in the workplace and the shortcomings of the law, cultural practices in Iran as it relates to protection of women um, from gender-based violence in the workplace. What is the situation in Iran in terms of the types of violence that women face at work, the protective laws and the work of civil society? Give us a sort of a brief overview of the situation well, in Iran right now. I'll try to be 
brief um, and the speakers before me laid out many, many important aspects of this work. So I'll try to focus on the context of Iran. Um, so in 2017, I did a report um, on um, discrimination against women in the employment sector. Um, it was when we were hoping that Iran would open up economically. It was after the nuclear deal. Our argument was that with the structural discrimination that exists in women's access to employment and, and the issue of sexual harassment was one of the obstacles um, and the disparities of access, opening up the economy would not benefit women in an equal manner. And unless the government changes course and changes protective laws, um, the effect will be felt unequally. That the opening up of the economy didn't materialize actually quite the opposite. Iran went through a period of um, um, deterioration of economic condition followed as a result of sanctions followed by COVID. And I think we have actually seen the disproportionate negative impact of the harm on women as well. The reason I, I emphasize this is because I think it's important to understand in what context we're talking about raising the issue of sexual harassment at workplace. Um, um, the data as well as anecdotes that we have show that women are discriminated against um, in law and practice and in employment. Um, we don't have specific laws that deal with sexual harassment at workplace. As a matter of fact, we don't have specific law that deals with violence against women. It is possible to prosecute cases of violence against women through um, criminal, um, through basically penal code and criminal procedure. And there are provisions in labor law or cyber crime law that could be used um, for those instances. But at large, we don't have a body of law that protects women against, um, against violence. Um, and so there's a, and there has been at least two decades of consistent campaigning on the women's movement to make this happen. And even after a 10 year period of working on a draft legislation, the latest draft that actually falls short of many of the, the, the standards that we would be advocating for, but would still be a step in the right direction has been stalled in the new parliament. Um, so this is the context that we have discriminatory um, personal status laws that allow uh, men to exercise their power over women's ability to work. We have inadequate protection um, against violence um, in general. Um, and on top of that, we have government policies and an ideology that advocates for um, primary role of women to be childbearers and, and, and holding the family together. Um, so whenever the government becomes more conservative or the parliament becomes more conservative, you see these whole waves of laws that are put forward that tend to facilitate women's, um, women's ability to raise children, but it comes at instead of equal protection, it comes at the cost of making it easier for employers to get rid of women, to not hire women, because we don't have a law, even though discrimination against women is illegal under labor law, there's such practice doesn't extend to, doesn't extend to hiring practices, promotional practices. So you can stop hiring women and nothing will happen. No one can tell you why you're not hiring women. Actually, it's in the research we did, it was, it's quite common to see in job advertisement that gender is specified as a qualification for the job. And for more technical, higher level jobs, um, managers take liberty at, at clarifying that they would prefer a man, a man to hold this, this position. Um, um, so in this context, women who are staying in the job market are fighting for a lot to be recognized by families, to be recognized by government, to be recognized by employer. Um, and therefore, it is extremely delicate to raise this issue and encourage more protection without giving a lot of power to those who would love to argue that, well, like we, we've always thought that workplace wasn't appropriate um, place for women because of all these dangers. Um, in the research that I did, um, the main issue that came up, and, and I want to be very clear, I mean, Charlotte gave a very good introduction. 
what I'm talking about is formal economy, private and public sector in very formal settings. We don't have a lot of access to informal economy, family owned businesses, small workshops that the vulnerability are, are, are order of magnitude higher. But in the context of formal economy that we're talking about, um, um, there is a general lack of unawareness about what constitute the broad definition of sexual harassment and lack of policies at the, at the co company level and also uh, mean clarity for, for reporting and investigating these cases over and over again, um, women and also human resource managers and, and managers and people in position of management um, told me that they're not sure who should investigate. They're not sure who they should go to if something like this comes up. In public sector, often security offices that are in charge of basically the security operation would be in charge of um, investigating those cases. Bear in mind, they're the same people who tell women how to dress and not dress. Um, so women repeatedly raise that they would not feel safe going to those people and report sexual harassment of a superior or even a colleague because the, 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 they don't believe that there would be a presumption of innocence on their part that, to begin with. Um, so in this context and, and lack of willingness on the policymakers to really take that up or inability of reform oriented policymakers to take that up, it has been very encouraging to see how um, Yet again, women's, women's activists have come up with innovative ways, grassroots ways um, to have this conversation on the ground um, and um, engage a wide, sec wide um, sector of audience from um, the educated uh, middle class and higher middle class people in employment sector, as well as businesses as well as local authorities and, and, and business associations to do this work. Um, I think we can talk about it more, but again, um, it is happening in the, in, in the context of no willingness on the government to address it, yet women taking over this women's rights movement, taking over this agency and raising it and taking on trainings and building coalitions and going directly to businesses and getting them um, to start looking at this issue as a rights issue and not solely a PR issue. Um, and I think it's been very interesting and I hope we get to talk more about some of their initiatives in, in, in the next half an hour, hour or so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tara John, for that um, overview. Um, it was very informative, and um, and I think you know we're going to get a little bit more. And maybe I'll ask that more specifically when I go back to Ahmad about protocols, because I think that that's really important. But right now, I want to. My question is for Charlotte. Charlotte, so you talked about the law that you passed in Lebanon, um, which is great because the last time I was in Lebanon, this is something that. Uh, the civil society was working on. I met with a number of groups and they said, this is something important that working on with parliament. So, um, but it was right after the revolution had started and things had really stalled. So it's nice to see that despite all the negative developments in the region, we have some positive um, developments as well. And this is one really very successful effort that you know makes us all proud and hopeful. But let us know what are the different aspects of the law? And um, what's going on with the law right now? Is it actually being implemented um, given the multiple crises that Lebanon has faced? Or is it, you know, are you kind of waiting for the implementation? What's the status of the law at present? And, you know, what are, what different issues does it actually address? Great, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, just uh, to say that, you know, I think it's, it's, it's really important to, to mention that this law um, brought together, I wouldn't say brought together, but created a, a forum where opposing parties uh, could work together to draft the law. And, and that's quite, I think, remarkable as well to say uh, within the context of, of Lebanon with so much um, issues, political and sectarian issues, is, it's very good. So I, I forgot to mention in, last, in, the, in my last comments that Ainaya is the dean who is the chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Women and Children, 
uh, as well as the NCLW were instrumental in the final drafting. So I just you know, think it's important to mention that. Um, so the law itself is Law 205. It is embedded within the penal code, which criminalize, criminalizes therefore sexual harassment. Of the 11 countries in the Middle East and North Africa within, um, within which we work, um, Lebanon joined six other countries in, in the idea of using having a separate law within the penal code, so criminalizing it. Uh, these other countries are Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Tunisia, Algeria, Yemen, and now Lebanon. Um, there are five other countries uh, that we work in that stipulate sexual harassment protections, but within the labor law, not criminalizing within the penal code. So that's really important to understand about um, the laws, sexual harassment laws within the region. So more specifically, what does it address? What does sexual harassment? So it expands the scope of harassment to include not only harassment in the workplace, it also has clauses on any place, um, public spaces. The law is also one of the first in the region to include very explicitly a cyber harassment as a milestone and makes it applicable to, um, to many cases during the pandemic that we're seeing more and more rising where more people are spending all of their life online. Uh, the law takes into consideration, very importantly, power differentials and what the dynamics of power and authority in the social relationship. Um, it takes us very seriously and has multiple iterations of, how, of what that would look like. This means that any asymmetrical power relationship between the survivor or the victim and the perpetrator are given special attention. So, for example, um, the, 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 the punishment if found guilty, will range depending on that power differential. So the range itself is anywhere from imprisonment of six months to two years and a fine of 10 to 20 times your minimum wage, or if it's, it's more severe, uh, imprisonment to two to four years and a fine to 30 to 50 times the minimum wage. People argue the minimum wage, that's one of the failings. What is minimum wage in a, where the lira means nothing? Um, but we can talk about that later. Um, so it, it, this, where the punishment will depend on a number of considerations, as I noted before. So, so for example, if the perpetrator is in fact in a position of power with respect to the victim, then the incidents do not have to, and the incidents do not have to be recurrent. So if you're familiar with American law, you have prid quo, quo versus um, hostile environment, both are included. Um, so if, if this is uh, if it's uh, this power differential is there, the penalty increases substantively. If the victim is a minor or a person with a disability, then it's also uh, increased substantively and also burden of proof no longer falls on the victim in that case. Other considerations too uh, for the penalties, if it occurred in a military department or an official department or a public institution or a university or municipality or school or nursery or club or in transportation, public transportation, penalties go up. If it's perpetrated by a person who has material, moral, functional, or educational authority, penalties go up. If it's perpetrated by two or more people, penalties go up. If it's perpetrated by a person with severe psychological, moral, or material pressure, penalties go up. So I'm giving you a lot of details here, but I think it's really important because the way that the law, although far from perfect, it has taken great care to integrate a feminist perspective on power in the way that um, penalties are put forward. In Article 4 of the law, it attempts to protect victims and witnesses as well. In Article 5, it, um, it uh, makes it very clear that employers ha should and have the right to initiate disciplinary action regardless of how the case turns out in criminal court and encourages employers to do so through, the, uh, through policies. Uh, I'll stop. Uh, just two more points. Article six, um, the government provides a special fund from the Ministry of Social Affairs to uh, provide assistance on the negative impacts on, on and, and um, for the victim or the survivor. Also provide special funds for the perpetrators, for the perpetrators rehabilitation, quote unquote. What funds? The government's bankrupt, but, in, but still uh, it is there in the law. The, the most significant failings of the law are it doesn't deal properly with the burdens of proof. As we know, many laws across the globe don't deal properly with the burden of proof. Um, it also, um, there, there, it's very slow implementation. You asked about what's going on in terms of implementation. There is the first case that came forward last year. Uh, it came forward in May of 2021, seven, seven women, uh, 
brought forward a, a court case against a um, director, uh, artist. Um, it, it, it was brought to court in December of 2021, a year after, a year anniversary. Um, it has been postponed or adjourned until April 14, 2022. It's very slow. It's the first case, uh, and we're still waiting to see what happens. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for that um, comprehensive explanation. I think it, the law, this law is really very exciting. I think it holds a lot of promise for the region, and maybe it can be a model for other countries who don't have a law. I know we have similar laws in Egypt and you know, I think other countries like Iraq has a law recently passed. So um, it would be helpful, I think, maybe to even compare some of these laws and look and see which ones are doing um, uh, address our concerns better than others or which ones are being implemented better than others for, as, a, as a as learning exercise. Um, Taraj, on you, you know, in Iran, we had recently a Me Too movement that, you know, there's been a lot of build up towards that Me Too movement. It's not, didn't just occur out of the blue as many people think, but um, it provided an opportunity for women to also talk about the harassment that they face in the workplace, including, I think, one of, one of the first accounts that kind of spurred this movement was also journalists talking about the harassment that they face. Um, how has that, you know, that movement contributed to the discussion on workplace harassment, and what have women's groups done? You know, have they utilized this this emergence of the women's movement to address the issue of workplace harassment? And if so, how have they done that? Um, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, the Me Too movement has been um, a significant um, um, step towards acknowledging the, the prevalence and the existence of this problem. Um, many uh, women decided to break their silence and go to social media and, and speak about um, speak about their experiences and actually started with with journalists. Um, uh, women's rights groups were working on these issues before uh, before the social media hype of Me Too. But once it happened, and I think the general public became very interested, they actually were able to step in and provide um, their years of um, content building that they had done on these issues in particular instances. An instance that was, I think, very interesting was that, um, um, so because Iran is pretty much disconnected from global economy, their startup industry is kind of domestically oriented and ingrown. Many of them are modeled after major tech companies in Silicon Valley, but they're all domestic. So we have the domestic version of Uber, Amazon, Craigslist, all, all, all of that. Um, so at one of these prominent startup um, startup um, places, um, an incident, a, a, a former employer starts speaking about incident of sexual harassment of a manager. It's a young, hip startup community with which is looked at favorably with high income from a lot of people. And then this um, was a very um, very lively conversation on social media about this company practice. And I, and I think at that moment, the HR managers came out publicly and said, we didn't know how to handle this. We had no idea how to handle this better. And that was when uh, one of the women's rights group that, that was working with businesses and private sector to train them how to deal with this stepped up and said, um, I think it just, they literally retweeted their tweet and said, if you don't know how to do this, we can help. And as I understand, they've gotten a lot of requests. Um, a lot of businesses have gone to them uh, for more training and more understanding. Um, so I think the work they had done, the familiarity they had with the context allowed them to take the issue further beyond just speaking about an incident of abuse to, to utilize that for, um, for, um, um, for bringing the community together. Similarly, um, there is another group um, that is also model after harass map um, has been working on issue of uh, violence in public space and they were able to and and the way they have modeled their work is that they've they've actually tried really hard to take a regional look and and bring up examples of successes in different countries so they were able to actually um, use the platform to spread more of their information and pamphlets one of the very interesting thing that they've they've done and many people might have seen it because it's one of their most public campaigns that they've done is that they've created brochures about what 
what inappropriate harassment can can be in public space and they've gone to businesses they've gone to cabs um modes of public transportation as people talk have this in in um uh, in a visible place for others to look and and then there was a spike of like people wanting to have those wanting to have them placed in their businesses wanting to help um and again all of these have been done on the civil on the side of civil society one one thing that's very interesting for me um and i think it's most recent more recent than um, the past two decades is going straight up to businesses and recognizing their power in making the change in a situation that, as I was describing, policymakers are either unable or unwilling to make the change happen, uh, but also doing it in a way that um, that is grassroots and is also tolerated by authorities, speaking about making the place safer for women without pushing this, um, pushing this too far that would basically cross the line of um, a national security issue, which is just these days, the threshold is very, very low for Iranian authorities. Anything that looks like mobilization on any issue can, can get them in trouble. Um, and what was very interesting is that um, actually women were, uh, even the, the movement was able to convince the police to conduct their investigation closer to international standards by no means in accordance with international standards but i think in one of the more prominent cases of me too that they were prosecuting the police came out publicly and assured the the survivors that if they come forward and share their stories with the police they're not going to press charges against them because in the iranian law um the consensual um, sexual relationship outside marriage is criminalized so the means of reporting are very, very limited for women. But doing this at a grassroots level, having the support and, and laying out the case, even force the police to actually acknowledge that they're gonna they're gonna work on prosecuting um, the alleged perpetrator without bringing more harm to women. Um, so um, I think a lot more work needs to be done, but, but it's moving forward um, and it's recruiting um, mainly businesses and business associations um, to slowly adopt policies. And it's happening at a very top tier companies, um, bit more aware, the ones that generally care about PR and want to be part of the, want to be seen as progressive. But I'm hopeful that this would have a trickling effect in different sectors of um, employment as well, and would be a norm setting issue that then could hopefully be transferred to legislative reform. But if I want to be honest, I'm not very hopeful about immediate legislative reform given the political context, but I'm encouraged that that hasn't stopped women from trying other routes. Thank you, Tara. And you can, you know, I think having progressive business, especially ones that are younger, more, you know, tech tech oriented, I think they can also working with different groups set the stage for more progressive behavior, which is, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, the story of our lives with Iran is that that the people tend to be more progressive than the laws, which is, you know, welcome, I guess, in in, in the time when we don't have a lot of legal reform. Ahmad, I'm going to go to you again, and I'm going to talk about the Me Too movement in Egypt. So we had a Me Too movement in Egypt over the last few years as well, and that's actually shown some of the shortcomings um, in major institutions such as universities to address issues such as, you know, sexual harassment. We had some, a couple of pretty um, important and really problematic cases, but also looking at the judiciary wasn't always necessarily up to task in terms of addressing issues of sexual harassment either. Well, how are women's groups and civil society utilizing this, this development as a momentum to, to advocate protection of women um, more and, and better protection of women in the Egyptian context? Uh, okay, so we have uh, um, like two different lines of work here. The first one is like the law and policy advocacy and this kind of work is still done by the same traditional like uh, NGOs, lobbying, working with parliament members, working sometimes with 
a national council of women sometimes they work on their own policy papers it's ongoing work like you know like uh, the new women foundation um uh, like uh, sometimes gonna be a horror or like the need like um there is few organizations are still doing the same uh, uh work um universities like sexual harassment units I talked like before that we in 2015 and 2016 we started and helped like 10 public universities to start their own sexual harassment units inside the universities. Uh, after a few years, some of them uh, changed their name from like sexual harassment unit to uh, violence against women units. Uh, I'm not sure like why in in, in in few cases, but like it happened. Some of them said like sexual harassment is really like tough word for the unit and they don't want like to shame women who are like coming to the unit, but like that's lame excuse somehow. Um, then um, that's for universities and like the normal, like traditional NGOs working. Um, our our work was like harassment, working on the streets, doing like events. Um, this, this kind of work was done by initiatives like harassment, BASMA, uh, uh, Opantish um, and other smaller like initiatives. Um, this work, like I can say, it, it ends in 2019. Uh, most of the of these initiatives stopped working or moved to a different spaces right now. Um, because like there is like several uh, reasons uh, about this, uh, but we had several waves of Me Too movements came to Egypt. Some of it came uh, to the media industry uh, and had like medium goals, like also uh, very well-known journalists. Um, some of it came to universities, specific universities. Uh, sometimes famous cases took over traditional media and like social media channels. Uh, but there was just two cases that changed a lot. Uh, the case of the rapist, uh, Ahmed Bassam Zaki, uh, and the Fairmont uh, case. Um, what's really interesting here that most of the reports, sexual harassment reports or like uh, reports about like uh, raping cases came from, with, with, two, with this two specific cases came from um, more of like a middle to upper class victims using social media, uh, talking like posting their cases in like in English. Uh, and that was faced by like a backlash uh, from like, of course, men and like uh, others, uh, other like old initiatives somehow. And for like few, maybe months, I think, um, even if they are started from like a middle to upper class right now, those new initiatives using social media are, I think they are using their voices and knowledge to talk for everyone. Else. And they are like reporting about like um, very normal cases happening uh, around Egypt. Um, also supported with public figures like um, uh, actors like Maya Said or Mona Zaki or Abbas Abul Hassan. The power of this like new initiatives came from how they echo each other cases. Like so, we are talking about like around four initiatives. They are using only social media and they are echo each other and they synchronize sometimes their campaigns. So imagine uh, uh, like four or five cases every, uh, sorry, four or five initiatives, every one of them have like half a million or like 200,000 followers and they are like very active follower. Still, they working online, 90% I think, or like 95% of their time, they are using social media, Instagram accounts, TikTok videos, they are not hiding. Uh, they are not waiting for permission to do the work. Uh, they don't have staff. Uh, just from my like knowledge, they are like only volunteers. Uh, they did. They are not like following the bureaucratic laws and methods we had to follow to do the work back then. So they are like faster. Uh, they are like um, using, uh, as I said, social media. They have like a lot of followers. Um, like. I can say this model is not 100% sustainable, but like that's what works now with uh, dealing with sexual harassment. We have also uh, this blog, uh, which is led by uh, like Egyptian feminists, it's called Daftar Hikayat. 
they are publishing anonymous testimonies against harassers and rapists using their initial letters. And that's our, this is, is making a very big buzz in the media and um, uh, film production industry because like they are naming or like pointing to uh, very well-known directors uh, or like um, journalists. Uh, they published around 41 testimonies till now since last year. Um, and they made a very big buzz. Um, those initiatives are changing the power dynamic of so many factors right now. Uh, but still, um, it's not a sustainable model uh, like, like all the initiatives. For example, I will give you an example, uh, two examples. Like we, ha we had this uh, a Moroccan singer that he's well known that he's a rapist, but like he's not convicted anywhere. And he was coming to Egypt for uh, a TV show and like, that's happening on the traditional media. Because of this attack on uh, this channel, they canceled uh, the show. We had also uh, an Egyptian uh, singer, uh, and he's also very well known on the production uh, field. And he canceled his show with uh, a TV, uh, a radio channel because also of the attack that's happening online. Um, I'm not sure if this uh, will continue or not, but that's what's happening now. Just normal, uh, modern new social media, TikTok. They are like talking to uh, the generation that the new generation. Uh, and sometimes they mention a government institution to deal with cases online. So it's, it's, it's more of, we don't have to go to the police to, to file a report. Like, so right now, um, the public uh, prosecutor have like an Instagram account and they mention him and they mention their office and they deal with cases sometimes and sometimes not. It's very new model for me, but somehow it's working. Thank you so much, Ahmad. Yes, I mean, I think both Iran and Egypt, you know, have experienced different, differing degrees. Um, restriction of civic space, but the civil society and especially the women's movement is very resilient and they keep coming up with new ways and technology is a big part of that new ways to push for their agendas. So they're raising awareness and, um, you know, addressing the issues that are important to them through use of technology. And so that takes me to my um, next um, uh, question um, to Tara, actually, Tara. So, um, given the constraints on civil society, which you know in Iran, which we see are increasing every day, even more so, and it's really a very sort of bleak situation for the most part for civil society inside of the country. But what is the ILO uh, Convention 190? How does that maybe open up the space for advocacy against, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 advocacy around the issue of Violence against women in the workplace. How 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 do you, how are women in Iran using it, or how could they potentially use it? Um, this UN, this ILO convention that Iran has actually signed up to. All of these countries have actually signed up to. So this is really a positive step as well. Um, yeah. So I think um, um, international instruments can can be powerful and helpful um, tools for women on the ground. But it's very important how. Um, they're being used and how um, accessible they are to people on the ground. In this context, I think, um, I, um, I don't think Iran has fully ratified it. So it wants um, for, for an international instrument to actually have real tangible effect on the ground, uh, we usually need um, stakeholders within government um, champions are willing to to adopt it, willing to um, participate in in um, conversations. Um, but we also need to make sure that civil there's civil society awareness and inclusion in the process. And that's that can be tricky because, um, as you were noting, the civil civic space is extremely limited in Iran. And in many of the instances, these women women's rights movements and activists are not included on the same platform as, um, as government officials and don't have equal access to participate in these forums and have their views heard. So how do you strategize in a way that you have government buy-in because you need government buy-in for international student in instruments, but also make sure that civil society understands the tool 
is included and can share their views and can take back what, what is given. And I think one thing that's very, very important and a positive about ILO is that ILO is perceived as a, as a pretty apolitical UN body that deals with norm setting and labor standards. Um, and that's positive in the context of Iran because women's rights issues can very quickly become po politicized. Women's rights issues are political. There's no way you can separate women's rights from other civil and political rights and, and the broader struggle for, for more rights. But politicizing them uh, really gives government an opportunity to um, to dismiss um, the concerns and 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 raise the national security issue as an additional block for for reform. Um, so ILO has the advantage of uh, Iran's buy-in. Iranian delegation is very active. ILO it's being seen as principle. It's being seen as an issue that is a right-based issue. So keeping that as such, advocating in the regional format as similar to this pattern, making sure women's rights movement in Iran is included and is, has access to, to the discussions that are happening around it is a good way. I'm not sure if it'll solve all the problems, but I think it's very important for us to make sure that we keep this, the, we keep this as form as, as it is. Um, because sometimes I think um, international pressure when it's just being taken up by opposition groups um, or um, becomes very loud, it can it can cause a splash, but it can also cause backlash domestically for people who are pushing pushing these issues on the ground. Um, so I'm hopeful that we people like you and others who are working can uh, come up with a multi-layer strategy that includes women's rights group, but also finds a way to, to get the buy-in from authorities to actually be excited about implementation, which is very, very difficult. Hopefully ILO will play a role in that. I have the same question actually to Ahmad and then also to, to Charlotte as well. So Ahmad, what are what are women's groups or civil society doing in Egypt to utilize this, this, this tool, this incredible sort of tool um, to advocate for better protections for women in the workplace? Several organizations are working on promoting the uh, C-190 convictions, such as like the New Woman Foundation, of course. Uh, we already published, um, uh, like I think, two research paper and policy papers about it. And they keep advocating like about it with other organizations like the Center for Trade Unions and Workers Services. Uh, also, several organizations are using like uh, the C-190 guidelines and their work as RES and uh, the other, most of them are like ex harass mob uh, employees and also the community hub uh, work, worked with UN women uh, on a very big um, uh, events related uh, to the same uh, convection uh, but it's not um, fr from, from what I know like um, it's not out of like this groups. Uh, no one talks about it a little bit right now. I knew that there was a, a discussion uh, about the law uh, between the parliament members, like young parliament members, I don't remember the name, uh, but like there was a discussion uh, about implementing uh, the C-190 into a law, but like, that's not happening soon, I think. That's what I know. Thanks, Ahmad. But it's good that the women's groups are working on this. And that, that's good to know about new women foundations. We'll contact yeah, them and see what they're the doing. The new women foundation are, I think they are leading with the center of trade unions. Sometimes even I see uh, the, uh, the, 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 the center of trade unions and workers. They had this event uh, in the International Women's Day uh, with a big workshop with a banner on the background saying please like sign on the 190 convection uh, with the ILO it was really interesting to see this on Facebook uh, from them it was really interesting yeah. yeah that's great and Charlotte so my last question to you and I think that this is a very nice way that you would you're in a very good position to sort of wrap up the um, dis these discussions before we move in to ask the audience if they have any questions to, to, to ask their questions. But, you know, so you've worked a lot, not only on Lebanon, but also regional. 
um, regionally on you know, promoting and, and advocating for business responsibility and prevention of uh, sexual and gender-based violence in the workplace. How do you think that this um, uh, Convention 190 of the ILO can be used regionally to advocate for better protections for women, um, at least in the countries that you've been working on? Um, you can hear me? Okay. Yeah. My camera died. I have no idea why, just all of a sudden died. So, but you I, have a beautiful picture of yourself. So we'll no, be no, happy to I look apologize. at your I, I hate the, not to see faces, but anyways, I can't do anything about it. Um, so great question. And, and I really enjoyed um, hearing the responses uh, or the interventions of Ahmad and Tara. I, I feel like um, there's a lot of synergies in the way that uh, at least I think, or, or Sybil has been, you know, thinking about ILO conventions and other types of transnational and intergovernmental conventions or efforts. Um, so the, uh, in particular, the ILO Convention 190 um, being the first international treaty to recognize the right of everyone um, to a world free at work, uh, free from violence and harassment um, is extremely important. Um, on the global level to bring together um, major governments and, and, and representatives to discuss to discuss it, you know, puts it on the platform. I mean, my understanding is I tried to look it up last night, 11 countries, 11 countries have ratified it to date. Um, Lebanon is not one of them. I don't think that there are any countries in the Middle East and North Africa that have quite a few in Africa, but not in North Africa. Um, so the issue of, of, of consensus building is extremely important and conventions use, it, for me, in my opinion, are a good channel for this. Um, but the issue of consensus building in context under sanction, in context, post-colonial contexts or contexts that have historically been colonized and still suffer from, from colonization, it can be a tricky, tricky. Um, it can be a tricky sell on the ground for activists to use. Um, at least that's in my personal experience. Um, but nonetheless, despite the, this trickiness and the politics of it, and sometimes the risk that's carried. I mean, less so with ILO, more so with maybe intergovern other forms of intergovernmental uh, uh, platforms. But in my experience, it's always been something that's important to, to be sensitive to and to navigate very carefully, particularly when you are working with uh, different political backgrounds. Um, so our work has not um, been specifically around the ILO Convention 190, although it is directly aligned uh, and, um, and has drawn a lot of insights from the debates and discussions around the Convention 190. Um, moving forward, it will definitely be a tool that we have in our tool house. Um, as a, pers a persuasion technique where, where these types of standards are, are, are you know, um, important to the ears of those that we're speaking to. But it is similar to, you know, in, in, my, in my world where it's private sector and other employers, a very big tool that is being used is the ESG reporting or the SDG reporting or the UNGC reporting. So bringing an alignment between those kind of conversations with the ILO convention is, is something that we're striving to do cautiously. Um, but the idea, the spirit of, the, of C190 is consensus building, which is extremely important. And, and my, my, from our experience at Sybil, you know, there are three steps that we would use this tool as a backdrop for. The first, I think very in agreement with Tara and also with Ahmad is engaging employers as a core partner for consensus building. Um, building a space to convene ongoing multi-stakeholder conversations that are sector-based, therefore nuanced, uh, because in different sectors, if you're doing an agriculture, the different manifestations of power and power dynamics are very different than if you're dealing with the banking sector, than if you're dealing with healthcare, than if you're dealing with universities, right? And this can't be a broad brush. We really need to look at the dynamics and the intersectional concerns of who's working uh, uh, in, on the ground and what are those power dynamics. Bringing together business leaders, HR managers, CSOs, NGOs, gender machineries, activists is extremely important. And from where I sit in a business school um, in Canada and in Lebanon, engaging employers as core partners 
in the consensus building when the government is due is slow to act or cannot act is extremely important. So what we have done with employers um, before the law was passed, helping to draft templates of anti-sex harassment templates that they can put within their codes of conduct, despite the fact that there is no law, has been quite successful. We started in Lebanon. We've worked and drafted these templates. They're publicly available if anybody else would like to look, look, look on them. We've worked with them with implementation and reporting and monitoring stat uh, strategies. This was in partner with SEEDS, um, which is a local CSO. We have now used this model and now doing it with eight countries across the region on sexual harassment, but other top forms of recruitment, retention, and promotion templates. Um, I think as Tara said, employers are somewhat open, but you have to like handhold and provide these free, if you will, consulting services. Um, sometimes you'll, in our experience, we, we have gotten people who, who have jumped on board. So putting a private sector uh, as partners in helping them to implement when they're half converted to it is important. The second step is, is for consensus building in line with ILO uh, C-190 is hands-on, local, customized, culturally sensitive, small wins and steps forward, I think is extremely important. And the third step, you know, and I'll stop here, but for me is we need to track data. We need to look to see, not to say anecdotally, not to be one research study that I do or Ahmad does or Tara does, but that we together across the region begin to create data for the region and from the region with the questions we wanna ask with primary data that we collect um, from activists on the ground, top, top down and meso level, company level, um, and not wait for governments to do it or for international indices to do it. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Charlotte, really good points that you made. and. Thank you, Tara and Ahmad, for this really very interesting and, and, and just very inspiring conversation. As I mentioned earlier, you know, Femina is documenting some of the work that civil society and especially women's movements have done in the region to address and prevent workplace harassment. So we welcome you to also contribute to this. And I know they'll, our colleagues will be contacting you, Charlotte, and others in Lebanon to, to talk to them. Um, and, you know, this is an important issue. I think it's an important issue for the region. And it's especially important to show that despite the fact that everybody thinks not a lot has happened in the MENA region, there actually has been a lot that's been going on that women's movements have been pushing for. Um, so we want to continue this conversation to sort of bring attention to the power of movements and, you know, how, how they spark these really difficult conversations and then how they go on to, to build partnerships and like you said, multi-stakeholder partnerships to, to advocate and to push for protections for women. So we're, we're going to continue this discussion and you know we welcome collaboration um, on this front in the future. We have about 15 minutes for um, questions. So I want to open it up to anybody who has questions um, to provide, you know, and I think there, there are a lot of people um, you know, who, who seem to be from the region, at least from their name. So um, that's really actually very exciting because we like to create opportunities for activists and people focused, you know, on the region and interested in the region to learn from one another, sort of a South-South exchange and, um, you know, that hopefully will lead to some sort of collaboration. Um, I'm just trying to see maybe there's um, questions that have been sent to me. Um, but I know there was one question that was asked earlier about protocols. And I think this is something that we talked about a little bit, Ahmad, about how do you go about creating protocols, you know, um, with businesses that you work with? Um, and what are those? And this is a, and I think that Charlotte also addressed it. A lot of that stuff was in the laws and that they were working with, with, with laws as well. But um, there's actually another question that's actually, or another um, person, Margaret Stafford. Um, yeah, working together is the best way to go. So agree. Uh, I'm working with the Salvation Ar Army in the Middle East region, and we are working in Kuwait. We work mainly with women and domestic service. Yeah, so I think that that's also another important um, question that I had. Maybe Ahmed, you can answer the question that um, uh, around protocols. How do you go about developing protocols? Yeah, of course. Okay, I will. In individual I will... workspaces. Uh, okay, sure. Uh, so, 
with universities, when we started um, uh, creating uh, policies and protocols, um, it was a little bit tricky because universities are uh, um, following uh, like different ministry than education. So we need we needed at this point to follow the like the public and um, uh, the governmental wording for everything. But with sexual harassment, we didn't had so many uh, similarities for because like the harassment model of defining all different kinds of sexual harassment was really, really long. So we had to adapt and to include uh, specific uh, uh, kinds of sexual harassment um, inside different kinds. So it was really, really tricky. We started with comparing different policies from all around the world, like from UK, from uh, France, from uh, USA. That's for university uh, specifically. And we gathered some kind of um, uh, one policy. And then we started localizing it for universities. We, we worked with Cairo University for like three months for like, we would like meet on a weekly basis just to localize and make, make this policy uh, looks like very Egyptian uh, paper. That was working with university and this policy was replicated in other 10 universities, the same policy we did. With corporates, it was more harder because like every company, for example, like Uber, they have their own like USA policy. And then Uber Egypt was related to uh, the Middle East uh, in Dubai and they had like an internal policy but like they didn't have uh, a policy about what happened between drivers and women who are like riding with them or like passengers in general so it was surprising for us and also like even big companies like big telecommunication companies they had a very small HR policy uh, not mentioning sexual harassment, but like they, they, they never had policies about what like their employees dealing with um, uh, like uh, customers. So with every company, it was different. We recycled other policies. We didn't try anything from scratch. Uh, we would like go research online and download policies and like offer them this and like then come back and recycle it. So it was a collective work also between Harasmab, Nazra, uh, Basma, uh, and uh, the Women uh, and Memory Forum. They host us for like so many times. Uh, so yeah, it was recycle other policies. We didn't write anything from scratch. Well, that's great. I mean, there's no reason ever to really start yeah. from scratch um, yeah. because some of these, so many of these issues are so common, to, to even you know across the region, but even internationally. So that's wonderful. That's why I'm so hopeful about the um, law in um, in Lebanon. And I'm not sure there was a comment here from Margaret about how they're working on these issues in in Kuwait on domestic workers. So this is a big issue. And that's one of the groups that we've actually interviewed in Lebanon. I'm not sure if, how does the law in Lebanon address the violence against domestic workers? Does it include them? Because we know that generally they don't have, they don't benefit from a lot of protection and support, Charlotte, but especially with all the developments lately, you know, with the revolution, the worsening economic situation, you know, especially after the blast, the domestic workers are open for a lot more abuse and, you know, um, mistreatment. How is that, how is that factored into the law? Is it factored into the law at all? That's an excellent question. So um, it, at the base of that question is whether or not the domestic work or domestic service is informal or formal. So a lot of domestic workers um, have informal contracts, not registered. Um, however, the law 205 talks about employment contracts and power differentials. And so in that general framing, domestic workers who hold a formal contract could theoretically and are protected and covered by the law. But 
we know that the majority um, don't work, you know, their contracts run out and then they become informal. And so in that sense, I think that there isn't protection uh, and there should be. And I just want to say one other thing across the, you know, you had mentioned before, like a, um, it would be really interesting to look at a comparison of laws across the region. We do have uh, a comparative report. We'd be happy to share that was prepared by Leal Sa'ad at Seeds for, um, uh, for Legal Reform, a CSO in Lebanon. Um, but um, just to say that what's really important when we're talking about um, the Middle East and North Africa and women protections and domestic work, domestic service, it's also about intersectional identities of migrant workers, of refugees, of LGBTQ communities, of um, people rural versus urban, right? So uh, the law is not blind um, to these types of intersectional identity when you have multiple layers of oppressive structures. Unfortunately, there's a bias in, 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 in the, perhaps those cases that are brought forward and so on. So we have a long way to go. Um, I'll stop there. Great, thank you. And I think we have one question here and I'm gonna direct it to, to Tara that how do you how do you envision the situation in five years in Iran, for example, on this issue? It's a difficult, diff very difficult question. I but, think I was uh, fairly until this moment that I have to <laughs> do the prediction. I'll try my best. Um, just to add to what Charlotte said, I think it's very important to understand when we're talking about um, violence, um, we're talking about hierarchy and, and intersectionality and different different power dynamic within societies as well. Um, I um, and so there's a, there's a whole movement working on migrant domestic workers. And I was very, very encouraged to see last time I was in Kuwait that in a conversation about this issue, some groups were advocating for inclusion of the migrant um, activists who are doing um, this work in the broader conversation. And that's what we, we were hoping for and it's moving towards. So um, I think it's very important that, uh, that Margaret raised this issue. And, and as we're doing this work, we need to keep reminding ourselves that we are dealing with um, population with uh, different elements of vulnerability based on their immigration status and, and, and their identity, the, the different identities that they hold. Um, quickly responding to where I think the situation will be in five years. It's very difficult to say, but I think the trend in Iran at least is that regardless of where the political power is going in Iran, um, the society is moving forward with pushing for equality. Um, they are uh, there, um, and I think that's that that trend will continue. That doesn't mean that the situation doesn't get harder with political repression, or um, or doesn't get more difficult when the economic situation gets more difficult. But I but I think if you we look at the trend, um, women's rights movement and and issues of gender equality has become has been central central to society. Um, moving um, forward, um, be in public spaces, um, private spaces in terms of relationships and breaking from the taboos and not relying on um, lack of um, protection in law, the society is moving forward with the norm. So I think five years from now, my hope is that we see this issue being more uh, accepted the, the the requirement for having policies and norms in private sector, um, but I but I hope one day we could regain some of our lost potential to actually push for legislative reform as well. I'm not sure if we would see legislative reform in the five in like within five years, but I think we'll this issue will keep getting momentum because people are pushing for it. And should I just quickly take answer Shiva's question as well? So again, um, similarly to the like similar to the region, women in Kuwait are also working on on their advocating for their version of domestic um, protection, and and has been recently passed. The issue of migrant workers is um, in Kuwait is um, is a very um, important issue for us because it's happening again. And the conversation about formal versus informal. There's also the conversation of the workplace and 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 with migrant workers, um, 
the employer holds tremendous amount of power. So despite the reforms that have been made to, um, to the kafala system in Kuwait, um, there, there are still issues with implementation and there's still issues with, um, with um, investigation. So um, while um, there has been movement and the, the manpower ministry it is, is working towards it and women's group are working on um, empowering migrant workers, a lot still goes unreported and abuses that are not at a very severe level that would require criminal investigation um, are often end up not being properly investigated um, and dealt with by maybe expediting um, exit um, permits for domestic workers or facilitating through through embassies. Um, with one minute, I think that's all I can explain, but there's a lot more to be discussed. So maybe we could have in future sessions, we could try to focus on some of the more subgroups and how that has that has played out. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for this really interesting and exciting discussion. We will have this video on our website. We'll share it on our um, social media. It should be on the CSW platform as well. And I think we only have one minute, but I'm going to give everybody just a chance to just with like one or two words um, really say, because this is a question that was posed to me. I don't want to leave it because I think it's such an important question to me and I know to the rest of you as well is how do we encourage better collaboration and information sharing on a regional level? So you, your answers can be just like a one or two words answer so that you know it's food for thought for how we continue this conversation. Um, Charlotte, do you wanna go first? Cause I know you've given a lot of thought to this. Um, yeah, I think it's really great. I mean, one or two words. So it's just to say like forums like this allow us to, I mean, we hear about each other, we hear about each other's work, but whenever there's a face to it. And so I think more forums like this are extremely important. And then, uh, you know, I'll certainly be reaching out because I'm always looking for collaborators who are like-minded, same spirit uh, and working towards change. Yeah, us too. We're, I'm really, we're really excited to be connected with you too, Charlotte. Ahmad, how, how do you suggest that we continue this 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 conversation and collaboration? Of course, like by organizing, like from my, um, my experience, um, uh, organizing uh, um, like normal, like meetings uh, uh, could uh, like lead us to both like new ways and like we discuss uh, what's happening. My, my opinion that we need to um, meet like very soon again, like maybe like Feminacad organized something for us. Uh, but like I have a few ideas, definitely I would like use from like Charlotte knowledge and Tara also like I need to discuss and like I can push it through uh, our like teams in, in Egypt right now. Great. And Tara, John, how about you? What is, what is your suggestion? I mean, again, this has been an excellent opportunity for me to learn from people who are doing this work. So I would just say going the extra mile to make sure people were doing the work <clears throat> are included. If that requires being mindful of security, if that requires being mindful of content, um, just doing that to make sure these, these spaces are created and preserved um, would hopefully allow more organic interaction and, and the space can, can just creating space for people who should be at the table, even if it's difficult, even if it's not the most accessible and convenient, convenient layout, I think is important. And thank you for always trying to do that. <laughs> thank you. Yes. I think everybody who knows me knows that the South South learning and exchange is really super interesting to me. I mean, that's why it's important to me because it's always, I learn so much from people and I've learned so much both from, you know, uh, activists and movements in Egypt and in Lebanon. And it's really an honor to be, you know, to be hosting this event with all of you here with your wealth of knowledge. And I think maybe creating spaces for deeper conversation is maybe something that we can we can do smaller people more private but just really deeper conversation about you know the nuts and bolts of how we do what we do but these kinds of spaces are important and we are committed to continuing that and also documentation so thank you very much we will put this information again on our website and our social media femena net or femina.net, you know, in different spaces. So please look for that. It should also be on the CSW platform and we will share it with our speakers and ask them to share it. Follow us on Twitter 
on Instagram and follow our wonderful speakers as well. Thank you very much for this excellent, excellent discussion. I learned a lot. And I think that people participating also learned a lot. Um, thank you. We'll stop at that point. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.